college is studying in the night thing. We're going to be studying tonight a couple of chapters in the book of Zechariah, the prophet. And Zechariah is referenced to, or many refer to him as the 11th of the 12 minor prophets. And I've often wondered, well, I guess I know why they refer to some prophets as minor and some as major. Daniel was a major prophet. Uh, Jeremiah, a major prophet. And then when you get to Zechariah and Haggai and Zephaniah and Zechariah both, they refer to them as minor prophets. And I really don't fully get that because there's nothing minor about the writing. Um, they are as major, as far as I'm concerned, as uh, any of the writers of the Old Testament, but they are referred to as minor prophets. But anyway, it was believed that he was born in Babylon during the time of the captivity. And he began uh, prophesying at a young age. He certainly did. And he, he prophesied to Jerusalem and Judah probably 16 years, I believe it was, after the first uh, wave of exiles left Babylon, after the 70 years was fulfilled. And then the first group of exiles, I think it was about 50,000 of them, returned to Jerusalem and was given permission to go there. And then 16 years later, they did appear on the scene from Babylon, uh, who was a contemporary of Haggai, the prophet, another so-called minor prophet, as they refer to him. But what they did, when those exiles returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, Nehemiah returned to rebuild the wall under, I think it was Zerubbabel, the governor, and then they were also to rebuild the temple. After they started building the temple, then all of a sudden they just quit, and for whatever reason, and started working on their own seal houses, the Bible calls it. And then the prophets Zechariah and Haggai came down and prophesied against them and told them, look, you're, you're building on your own house. And paraphrasing the prophets, which is more important, the house of the Lord's? or your own house, which is a good lesson for the church today. What is most important to us? Is it our personal lives, our personal possessions, our personal home, or is it the house of God? Clearly by the prophet Zechariah and Haggai, the house of the Lord was more important than their own houses. He said, you've left the work of the Lord and to work on your own houses. And of course, immediately then they returned and rebuilt the house or the temple of the Lord. So there is nothing more important amen, than one's walk with God. Certainly was, uh, is not. But in chapter 12 of the book of Zechariah, we'll be studying some out of chapter 12 and chapter 14. Because he, he prophesies concerning the end every bit as much as Daniel did. Now, he doesn't go into detail or, or didn't maybe see in depth the prophecies that Daniel did, but nevertheless, he prophesied of the very end time that we are living in. And he makes a statement in, in chapter 14, I believe it is, maybe around verse 12. And to me, he's implying that at the end time that I take it, that there's going to be a nuclear explosion somewhere, probably in Jerusalem around the back, but we'll see that when we get there. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, the burden of the word of the Lord, and these fellows would actually get burdened, they would get burdened down for their nation, for Israel, these prophets would. They loved Judah, Jerusalem, they loved Israel. Uh, when they were in their days of rebellion, these prophets that prophesied against them still loved the nation, and they had a burden for Israel. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. So we see here in verse 1 of chapter 12 that he was an educated man. He had been taught the precepts of God. 
and the things of God. And if he was indeed born in Babylon, which many think that he was, his family taught him there. He still received the teaching of the things of God by this very scripture itself, knowing the Lord is creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the layer of the foundation, such terminology that you found or you find when reading the book of Job. And the spirit of man within him, and here he's making reference to the soul. Now, most often when you read of the spirit of man, a lot of times actually, it's referred to the breath of life. But sometimes on occasion, the soul and the spirit are two words interchangeable. And the spirit is referring to the soul as he is making reference here. He said in verse 2, and I want to read the prophecy, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now he has knowledge that in the end time that Jerusalem is, he knows now that it is the city of God. He knows that Satan desires this city. That's why the Muslim religion in the Middle East today wants Israel, uh, not half the city, but they want the city as a whole. But as we know now, uh, which happened in 1967 in the Six-Day War, uh, Jerusalem or Israel took back control of the city of God. But yet half of the city, and I believe it's East Jerusalem, is even though Israel controls it, it is actually controlled uh, in part by the Muslim. That's what the Dome of the Rock is. And it appears that the Jews can't do anything about it. And the problem with the Dome of the Rock is it's built on the Temple Mound. And it's there at the Temple Mound. It's where the third Temple of Solomon is to be built. So there's great conflict there. And the Dome of the Rock is the most third holy site in Islam. It was there, I believe it was, that the Muslims believed that the Prophet Muhammad ascended up into heaven to God from there. And, and that dome, it covers a literal rock in which that he was supposed to have ascended into heaven. And, and uh, they don't allow Jews around that mosque there, the Dome of the Rock, and there's great conflict there. But I believe, and you've heard me say in, in my teaching, that I do believe that when the Antichrist comes and he makes a covenant or treaty with Israel, that Jerusalem will be split down the middle and half of it will be given to the Muslims and the Palestinians and they will make uh, East Jerusalem their capital which God has always been against Israel for trading land for peace. But for some reason, they have always did that and been out of the will of God. But I do believe one day it will be given to them, even though that Israel controls it now, just to, just to have peace, but it won't work. And he says in verse 3, and in that day, that term, in that day, that terminology uses in reference to uh, the same, same phrase as the day of the Lord, or what we refer to as the end time. That's what he's talking about here. That tells us that he's not prophesying of that day, but this day that we're in. And in that day, or a day that is to come, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone? It already is. It has been since Israel took back control of it in 1967. It's become a burdensome stone, that constant conflict between Islam and Judaism. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, he says. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And he makes a statement that he will, the Lord, will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. There's going to be a day when the world 
would turn its back on Israel. And even though uh, since its reforming and becoming a nation, America has been their greatest ally, I do believe at the end, and especially during the time of great tribulation, that America itself will turn against Israel. I believe that. In fact, the leadership in America is not too friendly for the Israel now. They are not. Obama, uh, it seems and appears to me, even though that he still claims America is a great friend to Israel, that he's more pro-Muslim than he is Jew or Jewish. It says in verse 4, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and its rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every house or horse of the people with blindness. Now this reference to horses and chariots is not actually horses and chariots. It's the armor that is used. I mean, it's modern day armor. These men, when they saw these things in visions, they saw it as horses. But we can accurately ter- uh, uh, determine or interpret this. They don't ride horses to war anymore. They just don't. Uh, even all of the news, when you see these terrorist groups, ISIS take, trying to take over in the Middle East, you don't see any of them on horses, do you? No. And <laughs> we don't have the cavalry anymore, you know, and the bugle boy and all that sort of thing. They did that when they didn't have these modern weapons. So don't be confused by that. That's the reason why that I say personally, that in Revelation 19, 11, when the Lord appears on the white horse, that's just a symbol. It's not an actual white horse. Verse 5, And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a uh, hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheep, and they shall devour all the people, round about on the right hand and on the left. Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Now what he's doing here, he's both prophesying of their destruction and at the same time that they're going to be spared. And what he's talking about, as we'll learn later on in the study, that half of the city goes into captivity. That's what he says. And he's speaking of a battle. And, of course, we know the battle to be Armageddon. That's going to happen uh, there in Jerusalem and in the valley of Megiddo. That's what he's prophesying about. Some 2,500 years ago, the Lord also shall save the tent of Judah first. Now he's going to look. You're going to have war. The enemy is going to come in blazing on horses. It's going to be a great battle. But the Lord also shall save the tent of Judah first, because that's where the action is going to take place, in Jerusalem. And we know that was the inhabitants of Judah, or Judah's portion. That the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. God, even though David at times got himself into trouble, and he did. And as I said the other night, I do believe David in the Bible supports it was the greatest king of all Israel, bar none. Now, there were some good kings, but David was the greatest. Even though that he failed in his lifetime, even though that he sinned in his lifetime, many different times, God loved David. And he loved David because out of all of the characters we read about in the Bible, the only man that God ever speaks of in this manner and says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man, a man after my own heart. He, he, he never says that about any other. Now, Daniel is referred to as greatly beloved of the Lord. But David is the only man in the Bible that you read about that God says that of. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And David was truly after the heart of God. David truly loved the Lord with all of his heart, even though the sins that he committed, 
the murder that he committed, the counting and numbering of Israel when he was commanded not. Still, he had a love for God in his heart that seems to be unmatched, and God loved him for it. And despite what he did, God established his throne forever. He certainly did. That's why that we read of the house of David. Every king that came down after David, David is referred to as their father. Even Jesus when he comes. They cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. And he was according to the flesh. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. Why? Because David was one of the greatest warriors that you ever read about in this Bible. He, he, was, he was just, he was a warrior from his youth. He learned to fight when he's in his shepherd's field all alone, when the lion and the bear attacked his flock, his father's sheep. He wasn't afraid. He was dependent upon the Lord, and he caught the lion and the bear. The lion by the beard and smote him, and he knew that God was with him from a very, very young age. That's why that he was not afraid to confront Goliath, despite his size. Because beasts of the field, lions and bears, we wouldn't have a chance fighting any of those. We wouldn't. They would eat us up. What, what sure they would. <laughs> I mean, we could really be no match for a million dollars, let alone a lion or a bear. But this young boy slew both the lion and the bear. And the only weapons that he had was a staff in his hand and a slingshot. And a few stones, that's all that he had. In the natural, that was all that he had. But the Lord saw down in his heart when he was at a young age that he was a man that would love him. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he's speaking of the battle of Armageddon. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Israel will never be defeated in battle again. Now it's going to come down to this battle that it's going to look really bad for them. Hundreds of thousands of them will be slaughtered. The houses rifled and the women ravished. But they will never lose another battle. Irregardless if all the nations of the earth, and they will forsake them as far as an alliance is concerned, they will never be defeated again. God will not permit it, and he's going to do it for his servant David's sake. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem, and he will. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. That's what we have now. The spirit of grace. And of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. He's talking about his crucifixion here. Zechariah has a great knowledge of God and of the things of God. And he is moved on by the Spirit of the Lord. Speaking of Israel, who in the natural is responsible for crucifying Jesus Christ. Because they, the high priest, manipulated the Roman government to crucify him. They did. And he says, here that's coming today. I'm going to have mercy on him. Daniel spoke of it as we just finished his book. How that there will be, as John referred to the number, 144,000 ministers, if you please, that will be teaching Israel in a time of great tribulation that, look, we missed it once with this man Jesus. We'll not miss it again. That same Jesus, as Peter said, whom ye have crucified has been made both Lord and Christ in that chapter 2. Simon Peter preached it. He tried to pe preach it to the Jews. He said, look, this Jesus that you're rejecting, this Jesus that you're saying away with crucified, this same Jesus has been made both Lord and Christ. Here's Zechariah. It's prophesying along the same lines. I'm going to give them 
and show them mercy and grace. And they're going to realize it. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Amazing again in Zechariah's time, 2,500 years ago, Jesus hadn't been born. I don't understand how Trinitarians cannot see that. But Jesus wasn't even born yet. Yes, yet this prophet was prophesying of him being pierced. And was he not pierced? So he was through the hands and feet. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem. It's going to be a sad time. Even as it was during the days of Adolf Hitler and how that he had such a hatred for the Jews. He literally hated Jews. And what it was, it was the demon that was in Adolf Hitler. The devil hated the Jews because it was the Jews that produced the Messiah, brought forth the seed that will one day, once and for all, crush the head of the serpent. In that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem, as in the morning of Hadad Rimon, in the valley of Megiddo. That's the battle of Armageddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart. None will be spared. And their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and the wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, and the wives apart. The family of Shimei apart and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, their wives apart. What he's saying is that when war breaks out in Israel, they will be greatly affected. And there will be a great, great slaughter. Again, you can read of the souls under the altar in the fifth seal. And it was those Israelites, those Jews, that died at the hand of the Antichrist. Skipping on over to chapter 14. He begins, and you can read chapter 13 on your own time. Okay. I'll trust you to do that one tonight. Can I trust you? <laughs> Amen. Because they go together. But verse 1 of chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now he kind of changes his phraseology. The day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And that has been my point concerning America. The scriptures don't lie. Notice what he says. For I will gather all nations. He didn't exempt anybody. He didn't say, and never have I read in Scripture and prophecy pertaining to Israel and their battles in the end time, do they, is there ever a reference to an ally? Wherein America has been their greatest ally since their inception, their rebirth in 1948, stood by their side. And America overall is pro-Israel. I'm just afraid that we have an administration that is not. But even then, and you've heard me say before, I really honestly believe in my heart that the United States of America, during the time of Great Tribulation, will ally with the Antichrist as opposed to Israel. I really do. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. What city? Jerusalem. The house is rifled, meaning plundered. They will invade their very homes in Jerusalem. The women, Jewish women, ravished. That word ravish comes from the Hebrew, Hebrew word that means rape. And they are, they are known for that in the Middle East uh, for centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years when nations would ride in and destroy other nations, they would, they would rape their women. That is well known and documented in the Middle East right now. ISIS, when it goes into these little towns and communities and takes over them, one of the first things that they do, 
conquer Italy, Romania, is they rape the women. That's, that's been a part of these heathen type people. That's been the mentality of these people. They are brutish. They are hedonistic. They are tyrants. They have no regard for life. Men, women, or children. They are pure evil. So I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, Jerusalem. The houses rifled. The women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Half of it will be captured. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then, something happens. When it looks like it's all over. Jerusalem's going to be taken. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. It's people slaughtered. He prophesies of the exact same thing that is prophesied by John in Revelation. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those people or those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Go to Revelation 19, 11, verse 11 through 14. Zechariah 14 and 3 is the exact same as Revelation 19, 11 through 14. And John said, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called, called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. That's Jesus Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That scripture is often puzzled me. It's still there. And he was clothed with a ve- clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We know by verse thirteen that that's Jesus. Those things on one and fourteen say when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that it's uh, absolutely without a doubt describing Jesus. And here are the raptured saints. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So back to Zechariah 14 and 3. God showed all of it. It's amazing how that these two men, John and Zechariah, live approximately 500 years apart, yet they prophesy of the same exact event. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4. Here is the return of the Lord. John makes reference to it in Revelation 1 and 8. And every eye shall see him. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't understand about these post-trib teachers, how they cannot see this. When it is described in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 4, that there is a secret coming of the Lord in which He only comes in the air. And that we are caught up with the dead in Christ together to meet Him in the air. And the Bible says, So shall we ever be with the Lord. And immediately the church goes back to heaven. But here is speaking of a complete different return of the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 4. And His feet shall stand in that day, the coming of the Lord, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Remember when Jesus went out in in Acts, I believe it was chapter 1, and the Bible says he led them out as far as Bethany. He was at the Mount of Olives. And a cloud came down and received him up out of their sight. And the two standing off with the two angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, you see, go away, is going to come again in like manner. 
It is the same coming of the Lord as in Zechariah 14 and 4 and Acts chapter or well, Acts chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 1. Two absolute distinct comings of the Lord. And but I guess it, if you just don't want to see something, you won't see it. And that's what a lot of trouble with a lot of people. A lot of people won't see things just because they don't want to. And it, it doesn't matter. We have to see things the way the Bible says. And the Scriptures absolutely emphatically teaches that the Lord's coming back in two different manners. Once in the air, once on land. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There's going to be a great earthquake. There must have been an earthquake earthquake in the days of Uriah, because the Bible references it. And this earthquake is going to split Jerusalem right down the middle. A great earthquake. Shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half of it toward the south. The Lord's going to split it right down the middle. And he's telling the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. Is that not what Jesus warned? In Luke chapter 21 are the same events here in Zechariah 14. That when that day comes, he said, pray that your flight not be not in the winter. Woe be unto them that are with child in those days, with such in those days. And that's going to happen so fast that they won't even have time to come down or go into the houses and retrieve their belongings. Jesus said that you will have to flee. Jesus spoke of the same exact time in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 as Zechariah's prophesying of in Zechariah 14 and Zechariah 6 as well. I, I tell you, I don't know where they get at that he was a minor prophet. There's nothing minor about this prophecy. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Zeal, yea, Ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come. Now, who's coming? The scriptures like this must just flip Trinitarians out. I mean, they, they must just get beside themselves when they read scriptures like this. The Bible is clearly making reference to the coming of the Lord. And listen to what it says. Zechariah said, And the Lord my God shall come, and all of the saints with thee. That's Jesus Christ. How in the... No wonder Trinitarians can't be saved. They can't. They won't. Except they repent and receive the love of the truth. You cannot go to heaven believing this morning. Absolutely not. When scriptures are this clear, when scriptures are so, have been given to us in an understanding that anyone should understand it, they won't have it because they don't want it. Is the greatest problem with most Trinitarians. I've talked to them. They absolutely reject the oneness doctrine. And they say that we are ignorant and unlearned. Yet the scriptures describe the one that is coming as the Lord God. The only reason why Zechariah didn't call him Jesus is because he didn't know his name. And we know by studying Revelation, well, even Trinitarians. They teach in their theology that Jesus Christ is soon to come. Don't they preach that? Jesus Christ is soon to come. Listen to all of them. Jesus Christ is soon to come. Zechariah called him the Lord my God. So they have to be one in the same. Jesus Christ is 
the Lord God. The difference between him here in Zechariah and his return in Revelation 1, when every eye shall see him, he hadn't been manifest in the flesh yet 500 years ago. But after John's writing, Jesus had been manifest in the flesh, crucified, and returned back to heaven. And John said, it's Jesus that's coming. Zechariah said, it's the Lord my God that's coming. And you could trick Trinitarians and ask them, are both of them coming? Are they riding two different horses? Or are they doubling up on one white stallion? I like to make fun of them like that. Must be. I mean, John, when... In Revelation 19.11, he saw heaven open and a white horse. He didn't say white horses, did he? Or two horses. And behold, the Father and the Son. That is most likely how he would have written it. Yeah, I would have wrote it. I've been writing a book. Maybe in two of them. I said, behold, two horses. No, three horses. God about the poor old Holy Ghost. We often leave him out. He must get awful angry at us at times. He must get angry at Trinitarians. <laughs> they probably speak less of him than they do the other two. Is it not the simplicity of the gospel? The simplicity of the gospel that when you know there's one, you can call him by name, Jesus, and you have all three. See, God knew that we were but flesh and that our intelligence is limited and that we would need this thing broken down to us in a way that we could understand it. Then he'd send us preachers to explain it to us. Right? He said, revelate our mind by the Spirit and give you a spirit of understanding. And open up your understanding that you know I'm telling you the truth. When I tell you there's one God and that Jesus is that God, you know I'm telling you the truth. That you've seen it for yourself in Scripture. The Bible says you can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear in the dark. A gloomy day. Joel speaks of a uh, gloomy day in Joel chapter 2. We do know that in the days of Joshua, Joshua 10, verses 12 through 14, that the Lord even made the sun stand still, giving him enough daylight. And God will supernaturally affect the elements, seasons, and times in the end times. And it is true, if you remember my teachings on the blood moon, which I have not yet accepted that as a prophetic teaching, but I do believe there'll be signs in the heavens, signs in the sun, the moon, seas and waves roaring. I do believe that. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear in the dark, but it shall be in the one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. So God's going to show, perhaps during the day of the battle of Armageddon, that God will do exactly what he did in the days of Joshua. Go to Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, speaking of the sons, not Ephraim, Son, stand thou still upon Gideon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Jalen. And the sun stood still. 
Now, Joshua thought it was just good, but we know scientifically that he didn't know why in the first place he was doing it. Is that not right? Why did he do so? But see, they didn't have astronomy like we have it today. And the sun stood still because it appeared to him the sun stood still. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jaser? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that day before it or after it that the Lord hearkened. Now, don't be confused. I do believe it's going to be happen just like that. The reference is that man won't call it this time. Now, you know, see, you always have to read both scriptures. You know, you get it off the nail. That's what the people do. They say, well, that day will never happen again. Yes, it will. That's not what he's saying. If you read the whole scripture. And there was, a, there was no day like that before it or after it. Now, this is the part that won't happen. That the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. That's the Zechariah 14 and 7. So I think that's exactly what will happen. That in the battle of Armageddon, the Lord will make the sun stand still, so to speak, so that battle can be completed. And it shall be in that day that living waters, how many know who that is? Who that is? That's Jesus Christ. He is the fountain of living waters. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the high the sea. In the summer and in the winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now who? My head's been a turn, God says, which one? It's amazing that they can never give you an answer. I mean, tinker with them when they're trying to talk to you and tell you how they see God. Ask them which one of the Lords is coming back. And the Lord shall be king of all the earth. Ask them who's king. When the Bible clearly says that Jesus is the king of kings. Yet Zechariah says the Lord, he's king. And the Lord shall be king of all the earth. In that day there shall be three lords and his name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, that's how I would have wrote it. If Trinitarianism was right, that's how it should have been written. If Trinitarianism was right, and there was such a thing as the doctrine of Trinity in Scripture, the Lord would have had it written that way. That ain't what he said. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And the Lord, that one Lord, the Lord of the Old Testament, which is the same as the Lord of the New Testament, shall be king, not kings, over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Now, if Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was names as they declare, is that not three names? I mean, they contradict themselves. I mean, they make their own selves seem foolish by teaching that damnable doctrine from hell of the Trinity. When there is no, it's a lie. It's deception. There is but one Lord in His name, one, and now we know His name, Jesus. That's in him. Verse 10. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate and to the place of the first gate and to the corner gate and from the tower of Peniel unto the king's winepress. And men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Now he's speaking of the millennium. 
which takes place immediately after the Battle of Armageddon, even though Jerusalem will be bombarded and a great slaughter, massive earthquake, they will be saved. Now, listen to verse 12. And, and I do believe, and it's my view, that he's making reference to a nuclear explosion here by this very verse. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Now, listen to what it says. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Meaning, it's going to be an instant. Whatever this plague is, is instant. Their flesh shall consume away or be burned away. While they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their eyeballs would literally melt in their sockets. And their tongues shall consume away in their mouths. When you study the results of an atomic bomb, a nuclear explosion, and radiation, it hits just like that. Men, when America dropped the two bombs on Japan, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, when those two bombs were dropped, immediately when they exploded, it burnt them to a crisp. Something similar to what is spoken of here in verse 12. We know now that Iran, which is the ancient Persians, they desire more than anything in the world a nuclear weapon. They have been in the process of manufacturing nuclear weapons since forever. Hence the knowledge is coming out. Just within the next month, our government in fact, I heard our president make reference to it today, that they're supposed to strike up some deal with the Persians or Iran on this nuclear deal. They are liars. Any nation that would behead, ravish women, kill children, even their own people, certainly is not beyond lying. And they have been trying to reach the status as a nuclear power for the last several years. Many believe that they are really, really close at this point. Some believe who oppose this deal that our nation may make with them that will make it easier for them to do it. I heard Obama say today that they would allow them to make use nuclear as far as or energy as far as power is concerned and things of that nature. Many people won't tell the truth. They are lying devils. That's what they are. They hate America. They hate Israel. And they are the kind of people that would unleash a nuclear bomb on anybody. They're that crazy. They're not smart enough to know. I mean, they'd drop one on the United States. No one that the United States could just wipe them off the map at the snap of the finger. They're that crazy. Or possessed is a better word. But I do believe that verse 12 is making reference to some sort of a nuclear confrontation. It's going to come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, of the ass, 
and of all the beasts it shall be in these tents as this pledge. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year. Now it's speaking of the millennium. Even Russia or Magog, a sixth part will be spared. Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. That's going to be during the time you can read about it. We won't go to tonight, but Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. It is speaking of a time when the devil himself shall be bound and cast into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. There will be peace on earth. That city, New Jerusalem, will come down. I believe that it will come down right where Jerusalem is now. The redeemed Israel that is resurrected, the raptured bride, will live in that city for 1,000 years, and we will literally rule the world. And these nations that are left over, that was not destroyed, will come up once a year to worship the king. Why? There will be no devil. The Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall come to pass that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain, for they won't be blessed. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen, that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's going to be worldwide law that all the earth is to have to worship as Israel worships and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we know what happens over after a thousand years. Most likely most of them do it because there's some nations that won't. The devil's turned loose again. And then after that thousand years, he goes out into these nations that wasn't saved, and he convinces them to march on New Jerusalem as they marched on Old Jerusalem. And then will be the final battle, and the Lord will destroy them with the word of his mouth. Satan then, after being turned loose for that thousand years, will be once and for all cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, John said in Revelation. Verse 20, In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seize them therein, or seize therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts, meaning the end. So Zechariah had clear prophecy concerning the end times. And to me, every bit as major as anyone else that saw concerning the end times. In fact, he goes into great detail and great specifics as to this battle. And most of all, the return of the Lord. You see, the Old Testament prophets did not see the rapture. Zechariah didn't see it. Daniel didn't see it. Jeremiah didn't see it. The only writer in the Old Testament that I know of that come close to it, and if he did, he really didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't understand it himself, and that was Job. When he said, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wake and I change again. That change, now he was referring to his resurrection, but that very terminology is used by Paul that we must be changed, we all shall be changed. Job made reference to it inadvertently. He really didn't understand it, but he did at the coming of the Lord. And then went on to say, Now that I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that at the latter day he shall stand upon the earth, and though my sin once destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. 
so even though he didn't really probably understand it, it did make an inadvertent 